Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, Francis Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Randy Mason. And I'm Vanessa Severo. We're here at the new Midtown home of Unruh Furniture and yeah, it used to be a church. This week on Arts Upload, we'll look around in here and also share a story about folks who make much softer goods. Plus the making of a major production at the Kaufman Center. An oft forgotten bird man and chalk like you've never seen it before. All ahead on the Upload. Given that you've traveled many a back road, I'm guessing you've been to Hamilton, Missouri? Absolutely. Highway 36, just east of Cameron, best known probably as the birthplace of J.C. Penney. But that isn't why downtown Hamilton is such a busy place these days. No, it's almost like a vision quest for quilters anymore, thanks to it being the headquarters of Missouri Star Quilt Company. As producer Ashley Holcroft shows us, family and fabric are coming together, creating quite a quilting empire in rural Missouri. Like many of America's great small towns, Hamilton, Missouri had seen its glory days come and go. But that all began to change in 2008, when the fates of a family in this town of less than 1800 became entwined, turning something very bad into something very good. In 2008, there was a major crash we lost all of our retirement, my husband and I. And the children started thinking about what we could do in our retirement that would keep us out of their basement. The path to their ultimate success would be lit by a simple question. One day I was going to pick up a quilt that had been quilted. And my son said, well, what quilt is this? And I said, I don't even know. And he says, "Are you, what do you mean you don't know? And I said, I can't remember what it was. I took it there over a year ago. And so he starts thinking about this. And finally he says to me, is this a thing? I mean. This long arm quilting, is this something you could do? Because if it's, if these people are backed up a year, you know, there's a market for that. And so they decided to buy me a quilt machine. A quilt machine that was too big for the house and cost more than the building they bought to house it. You have this little thousand square foot shop and you could open the door and peek in and like see nothing and be like, okay, I'm good. And we're like, oh no, you gotta come in. We decided that we should start doing YouTube videos to tell people about quilting, because we looked online and there's, there just wasn't a lot of great video content there. And I was like, hey, Ma, we, you want to do tutorials? Okay, I'm game, but what's a tutorial? Let's just say she got the gist quickly, and soon they were racking up viewers on YouTube. A growing group who not only wanted to quilt with Jenny, but quilt what Jenny quilted. People started calling us and they would say, hey, you know that fabric you used in that video? I'd like to buy some of that. And I was like, well, that's my fabric. And, and they were like, well, I want some. And I'm like, but it's mine. You know, and they'd be like, well, where did you get it? And I'd be like, oh, I'd think back and I'd think, oh, 1984, Ben Franklin. You know, I had no idea where I got that fabric. So I said to the kids, maybe we should think about selling fabric. So we checked into it, we couldn't afford it. But help was on the way. Enter the newly minted Moda pre-cuts. So it was one square of every fabric in the line and they were in these little packets. So I would make a project out of the packet and we'd buy one bolt. So we started doing that and that and YouTube is what catapulted us into being familiar to people. People, people were looking online for easy and quick ways to do things and then they're like, well, I could just buy one of those packs, you know? And so that's really kind of when things started getting a little bigger for us. Being catapulted into familiarity has its perks but growth has its demands. That's where the Dones were uniquely positioned to succeed. And thankfully, we've got you know the seven kids in the family and we're all willing to work for free for several years before we got a paycheck. And, uh, and by doing that, we were able to pivot and iterate and iterate and try and do things. And then we finally found stuff that stuck. We are a normal family. We all are very strong, opinionated people. We all don't have any problems sharing our opinion, but the reason we have owners is because the buck has to stop with somewhere. Now, in the beginning, the kids said, you know, mom, do you wanna be one of the owners? And, and um, I don't, I don't. I'm a really good worker. 
I'm a, I'm a really good face for the company, but I don't own the company, and there has to be somebody in charge. Of Jenny and Ron's seven children, five work for MSQC and two are owners. Sarah is in charge of the customer's experience in town. How we've decided to do it is kind of get different styles of fabric per shop. There was a bunch of buildings available that were kind of just sitting that hadn't really been rented out. And so we just kind of purchased one at a time and we've been able to bring them back to life essentially. First we were worried, would people want to walk from store to store? You know, it's outside, it's like we have, I mean, it's Missouri. So we have freezing weather and we have hot weather, you know? And really, I kind of, I tease that it, it cleanses your palate, right? From each, each little walk. <laughs> You're like, okay, I'm ready to see more. One of Alan's longtime friends, Dave Mipsa, tends the finances, while Al oversees the customer experience online. Quilters are sort of this, this group that they, they don't get enough credit, right? They're like the happiest, most cheerful, most supportive, most loving people. Like I built the website, right? I built it from scratch. And then we launch it and it breaks. And you get these people that'll be like, hey, just so you know, things aren't working so good on the web. I'll hold my order. Don't worry about a thing. I'll be back. I know it's probably hard today. It's, it's a big day. And I'm like, really? Oh, thanks guys, because it's really hard over here. And I'm like, I am stressing out. And they're like, don't worry about a thing. It's quilting, right? It's, it's been around forever. And it's like, yeah, yeah, but this isn't your mom's quilt yeah. shop, right? This is, a, this is a new way of doing it. We're kind of reinvigorating this industry. What we saw was that like moms and my grandma, like they love to quilt. But Sarah, my sister, she doesn't have three months to put into making a quilt. So we had to simplify it. We had to make it easier. And so we had to come up with these ideas to be able to, to let people make a quilt in a day. You know, we're just trying to figure out ways of letting people experience success and have a good interaction with the hobby and the, and the art of quilting, and then circle back. And like, you'll do your bigger, crazier, more intense stuff as you get more and more confident. What started with a single long arm quilt machine has ballooned to 13 stores, over 400 employees, a massive new warehouse, and a national small business award. The Missouri Star Quilt Company is still steaming ahead. But for this family, success has come in both tangible and intangible forms. What I didn't realize in the beginning was, for me, um, this, was, this was all about sewing, and I really thought I was sewing. Now these letters start coming, and they come from women who are handicapped, um, women who have MS, a man with agoraphobia, who, who he says, I know I'm in a prison of my own making, but for the first time in my life, he says, I feel like I am doing something that matters. Who, who, who gets to have those kind of stories told to them? Who gets to do that? It's been more than anything I ever dreamt of. Yeah, there are some nice parallels with Missouri Star here. Unroof Furniture started in a garage in Grandview and now employs over 20 people who work in this 36,000 square foot facility. Our next story is also about building, just not using traditional materials. It's about putting together a really big show that brings in really big bucks for the UMKC Conservatory. It's called Crescendo, and back in November, producer videographer John McGrath got to see the gala getting its act together. Show of hands, anybody who's never done crescendo before, raise your hand. Okay, that's quite a lot. Well, here at Crescendo, we have a, a numerous performances by all the artists and students here at the conservatory. It's our fall fundraising gala, so we try to showcase all of the talents and um, things that we offer at the conservatory. Crescendo performance is a seamless show. We go from piece to piece without applause in between. It takes about a year to plan Crescendo. They've already got next year's day set, and they're gonna start working on a theme and everything else. And throughout that year, we talk about things and plan things, and we put pencil to paper, and we think, and we dream. And it can get kind of daunting after a while. 
We've been doing Crescendo in this format for about the last six years. It's sometimes hard for us to get music students and dance students on the same stage at the same time. This allows them an opportunity to do those things together. So, here's the run order of the show. You're going to see the orchestra, the wind symphony, the choir. You'll see some jazz bands. You'll see dancers. You'll see some of our professors in brass and oboe and piano. And you'll see everything we do together at some points as well. Thinking about getting from piece to piece to piece happens instantly, automatically, and it have to get the right people in the right place at the right time. So we're going to spend a little bit of time practicing the transitions, and then we're going to run it top to bottom. Okay, this is your cue to tune, like cue to go. We will go through a cue to cue, so we'll do lots of sitting and standing and running through the light cues. As soon as you see lights hit you, that's your cues to go. And then after that, we'll do another run through of the show and fix any problem areas. Trying to fit all those bodies on there with all the intricate moves, and it is a ballet, so it's very, um, um, very hard to fit them all there, but we try to make it work the best we can. But the great part about it is once we're all in the room and the kids are making music, everything that we've done to plan comes to fruition, and it's always a feeling of joy. <laughs> um, I think it's just most important the, the students get a chance to get out into the community. Uh, we get to play at Kaufman in this awesome uh, performance center, um, and we get to show um, the people here in Kansas City uh, what we're doing at the conservatory and the uh, music we're making and the work we're doing. Oh my gosh, Hellsberg Hall, the Kaufman Center, amazing. We get so many opportunities to perform here, so when we are here, we cherish every moment. It is very cool. Um, the acoustics in this building were made very specifically for this kind of performance, and actually my father worked on this building, so um, it's very cool for me to come back to this place and hear what it's like, this thing that he helped create. It's amazing to play here. I love playing here. I've been playing here for a few years now. I was in Youth Symphony. Um, we played here and uh, just getting to play here is an awesome opportunity um, to give us just a chance to see what it could be like um, to get out in the real world. We're training to be the big shots and um, those big shots were in our shoes when they started and they did the same thing and now they're there and we're, we're going to be there shortly. So These are where the pros come from and this is what we're here to do. These students will amaze you unbelievably and how incredibly talented they are. Uh, they don't look like students, they look like professionals. It's a mix of our very best faculty and students on stage. It's the best and brightest of what we do all at one time. We are professionals in training, so it's a good way to encourage those people so you have people to see in the future. Because if you don't encourage us now, there may not be any professionals to see later on. From me to you, thank you. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your artistry. Thank you for being here and for making this a special place to be. The 55th Annual Grammy Awards will be handed out in Los Angeles this weekend, and you know some local folks might just walk away with one. Joyce DiDonato, the Kansas City Symphony, the Kansas City Chorale, and Pat Metheny all have nominations. But this next story is about someone who never won one, and except for the true aficionados, has largely been forgotten. Gene Clark was a founding member of The Birds and so beloved that a symposium about him and his music drew fans from across the country in 2014. Here's a look back at a piece that first aired on Arts Upload two years ago. He was born in Tipton, Missouri. His family moved to Kansas City. He was a baby and grew up here, went to Raytown High, and then graduated from Bonner Springs High. So he was an important part of Kansas City's music history. You know, Gene, he heard the Beatles, and uh, that kind of changed his mind about wanting to stay just in the folk vein. It was folk music back in 1963, which first whisked Gene away from Kansas City. Seems several members of the new Christie Minstrels, remember them, were in town performing at Starlight Theater, saw Gene's group, the Surf Riders, playing at a club on the landing, and pretty much offered him a job on the spot. 
Just a year later, Gene Clark's storybook tale took another amazing turn. He met Roger McGuinn at Troubadour in Hollywood after he left Christian Minstrel. And David Crosby ambled over and started singing some third part harmonies. And before he knew it, the birds were born. By the time Gene was 21 years old, he had a number one hit. Only uh, about a year before that, he was out driving a tractor in a field. So it was kind of, you know, phew, you know, skyrocket to the moon kind of thing. Well, I've been running around, trying to prove I was in love. But the man who took us eight miles high couldn't maintain the orbit for long. Just two years later, ironically in part due to a fear of flying, Gene left the group to embark on a series of solo projects and musical partnerships with some of the best folk, rock, and country players around. A 25-year musical odyssey detailed in a documentary called The Bird Who Flew Alone. And I laughed as the Joker said, lead on. And all along, he continued to make music admired by his peers but largely ignored by the record-buying public. There's a train race here this morning, I don't know what I might be on. In 1991, burdened by problems with drugs and alcohol, Gene Clark died at the age of only 46. Have you seen the change in rivers? Now they wait their turn to die. There's a handful of his songs that people just go crazy over. And once they hear those, they want to go a little bit deeper. And they get a little bit deeper into the catalog, and they find another handful that they like just as well. And then they'll go a little bit deeper. And at that point, you're stuck. You know, it's like the La Brea Tar Pits. Have you seen, have you seen the silver raven? She has wings and she can fly. Cell phone. Thank you. Though it's mostly symbolic, the no cell phone rule to prohibit bootlegging is in effect here at the Phillips Hotel, just three days after what would have been Gene Clark's 70th birthday. Like the first one three years earlier, this symposium has drawn participants from near and far. The kind of writers, fans, and collectors who just can't get enough of the music Gene Clark made. Some of them come from original tape reels from 1966 that Gene actually made as five demo songs. You said I love you, wish you were here. Gene Clark, in my opinion, will be seen in history as the greatest combination singer-songwriter who's ever lived. To me, he's up there with Neil Young and Bob Dylan and at, at that level. But people, you know, Gene who? He had a great voice, he had great lyrics, incredible music, just ethereal music, almost like, like a Mozart or Puccini. I'm a musician myself, so I tend to hear the chord changes, and I'm one of the songs they just played, I'm, I'm sitting there going, okay, that's C, E minor, and then all of a sudden it's like, what the heck was that? David Crosby said, Gene Clark didn't know the rules for writing music. So he just wrote it however he wanted it to sound. What a prolific songwriter he was. It never stopped. To the day he died, he was still producing music. I'm fascinated by his creativity. There's only a certain percentage of all that stuff that he wrote that ever made it to being released records. And I want to hear it all. Deep discussions about deep cuts dominate the proceedings. But there's also time for symposium goers to get out and see some of the places that helped shape Gene Clark's art. Like this railroad trestle near the family's home at the edge of Swope Park. He later wrote a song called Kansas City Southern. Or the venerable old Dairy Dine, where Bonner Springs teens like Gene spent lots of their leisure time. And of course, 100 miles to the east, his first home and final resting place. This year, Tipton, Missouri and Los Angeles also held Gene Clark tribute concerts. There was this 
something about Gene that you know, people were drawn to, and not only in, in terms of his musical talent and his songwriting ability, but just you know him as a person. You know, despite you know whatever demons he might have had and uh, things he struggled with, he was still people still loved Gene a, a lot. I here set my hand to be caused to be affixed this great seal that proclaims November 17th to be Gene Clark Day in Missouri. Oh. hear R.E.M. and what they did in Athens, Georgia, you know, or the early 90s country sound in Nashville. You know, there, it's a big Birds influence. So, you know, a big Gene Clark influence, you know, all over. The songs in, have endured, you know, some of them for, for 50 years, and I think they'll continue to endure. And I probably feel a whole lot better when you're gone. Now when you're gone. Unroof furniture here at 36 and Walnut sits in an imposing structure to say the least. Originally, this was Westminster Congregational Church built in 1904. Sam Unruh was looking for a place where he could turn out custom made desks and cabinets and, and beds and tables and people could actually watch as the stuff was being made. The Unruh mission is about character and detail, not mass production, and it's really an experience in itself to see what they've done with the place. Nothing quite like it. Hard as these guys work here, everything stops at 10 o'clock on Wednesday mornings so they can engage in a rousing game of a kind of ping pong called sprinkles that keeps everybody on their toes. Yeah. Run, run! Oh. Well, as is often the case on Arts Upload, we'll wrap up with a piece from one of our PBS peers. It comes from Boulder, Colorado, where Bryce Widom has been leaving behind a trail of masterworks in chalk on the menu boards of restaurants and bars. One of the reasons I love working with chalk, specifically, is that it's like painting while drawing. Pretty much how I paint is whatever's most alive in me ends up going through me, sifting through, and then it comes out like this. Me drawing these people, these characters, who had something to teach me that I wanted to become in some way, and that actually helped to lead me. Maybe parts of me that I'm a little leery of fully stepping into. I recently did A Woman with a Sword, there's a parallel in drawing, like having a sword and making lines in space. Just like every time that I make a mark like this, it's actually movement and it moves stagnancy that is in me. Painting helps in so many ways. Where is the flow? Where is the movement in this creative act, this creative composition? It releases the, the contraction in me that has me so often getting headaches so that if I keep the energy moving, there's a freedom in that. These chalkboards are all related to the season that we're in. Right here, there's gonna be a lot of green coming up and this is spring and then flowers, buds going into full blossom. And then the phoenix and the fire is like the peak of summer. So that cycle of life, death, rebirth. Because the artwork is happening in accordance with this timing in nature and the seasons, then maybe it'll help all of us when we're on our phones and we're in this world and we have this schedule that is not exactly related to what's happening in nature. But part of my aspiration is that this could pull people into a different type of timing, nature timing. All these people who come and say that they like experienced a really hard moment in their life while they were sitting at a table like in a pub and, and there's something about the artwork that allowed them to be with their experience in a more real way. Other people who have gotten like engaged while that artwork was there and it serves as a marker for them. So, the, just the excitement and the, the joy and the inspiration that I hear when people are like, oh, you're that guy. 
that spark of life uh, and that spark of a potential that wasn't there that now is in them, that's beautiful to me. Wow, what can you say? We've had just a little bit of everything in this week's show, from chalk to quilts with music theater and even a little ping pong thrown in. I can say we have to leave now and leave the folks at Unre Furniture to keep working wood the way they do so well. But we'll be back next week at the Uptown Theater looking at Folk Alliance International and painter Laura Shipley. Till then, I'm Vanessa Severo in for Maris Aylward. And I'm Randy Mason. Thanks for watching. Production funding for Arts Upload has been provided in part by Muriel McBrien Kaufman Foundation, Hall Family Foundation, Francis Family Foundation, The Hartwig Family, Courtney S. Turner Charitable Trust, and viewers like you. Thank you.